Are you ready, Ken? I'm ready. I'd like to call. I'd like to call to order the Thursday, March 24th, 2016 Board of Adjustment. Uh, roll call, please. Arnold. Here. Dolly. Here. Stein. Here. Shriver. Here. Stonebarger. Here. McGuire. Here. Hansen. Here. Albertson. And Bill Johnson is absent. We have a quorum. Thank you. First item on the agenda is the approval of the March 2000, March 10th, 2016 minutes. Could I get a motion? motion. A second. Motion by Mr. McGuire. Second by Mr. Stein. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Second item on the agenda is Charles Redland doing business as Prairie, uh, Prairie C.A.R. L.L.C. Permit number 16570 seeking a variance for requirements of uh, city zoning ordinance for the property located at 1404 9th Avenue Southwest. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, as stated, this is application <clears throat> for permit number 16570. Uh, the C3 zone lot of record is compliant with an area and width regulations. The existing 4,636 square foot structure is non-conforming commercial building setting 10 feet from the side west property line where 20 foot is required. <clears throat> the proposed 1,444.5 square foot addition will be constructed in compliance with all the current height and placement regulations. Uh, the parcel lacks the standard boulevard and infrastructure requirements, boulevard grass trees, sidewalk trail, curb and gutter. The board has the authority to require fulfillment of any and all boulevard infrastructure requirements in conjunction with any special improvement authorized by the building permit. This is the same one that came to you guys two weeks ago that we just took it through the conditional use for them to have light manufacturing. Again, they're just going to build a uh, conforming addition down here, but since it's a non-conforming structure, it's got to come back before you even for a conforming addition. All the required parking can be satisfied just by the parking area they got to the north. Any additional parking is just overbuilt. This is good to go. Thank you. This one, the reason it's here is it's got a 10-foot side yard setback. That's, that's the encroachment. The uh, additional building, that the addition that's going on the back does not increase the encroachment, correct? Not at all. No, it, it maintains the 20-foot setback. Correct. Anybody have any questions with it? I'll open the public hearing if anyone's here to speak on behalf or against the permit. One question we had uh, when we visited this a couple weeks ago was the employee parking, and they... they uh, they more to satisfy the requirements. They'll be able to keep that on site rather than on the road. Correct. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Ask for a motion and a second for any further discussion. Motion by Mr. Stein, second by Mr. Dolly. Any other discussion on it? Any questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number three on the, the agenda is R&R &R Holdings, Holdings LLC, permit number 12941 is seeking approval to modify a site plan uh, that previously was approved with a conditional use. The address for that is uh, 2301 North Highway 20. Again, this should look a little bit familiar to you. R&R um, Holdings was. LLC seeks approval for the Some modification of were, to the yeah. site plan of a previously approved conditional use to allow a 5,376 square foot, 32 by 168 building with 12 storage units. Where previously, this board approved a 4,500 square foot, 30 by 150 commercial storage building. So basically what we're down to is the proposed building that's going to go over here. When they first came to you, they had put that as 30 by 150. Everybody's been telling them they got to go at least 32 feet wide to get those campers and boats and all that stuff in there. So they're just coming back and modifying it. Since it was a conditional use, they got to come back to you to go for and they just want to make that building 32 by 168 versus the 30 by 150. There's no other issues or conditions that's with this. Other than <coughs> going, you have the authority for any boulevard requirements and stuff. But the bike trails there, there's uh, some pine trees. There's enough trees there to meet the minimum 50 foot minimum requirements, whether you want them to tear out the pine trees and put in deciduous trees or not, it's up to you, I guess. Thank you with that. I'll open the public hearing if anyone's here to speak on behalf or against the permit. And it was public notice and nobody has spoke for or against it. So. Ken, originally this came to us in 09. <laughs> Yeah, way back when. When they then first they built the building, we went through it. That was extensively. Yes, it was extensive at the time. Yep. We approved, we approved this building. It was going to be done in another phase, and they're just doing it now. Well, we, we did it in 09, and they came back in 15 to, put that, to add the building period. And now they're just coming back because they wish to make that building slightly bigger than it was before. 
Okay, thank you. Is anyone here to speak on behalf or against it? If not, I'll close the public hearing, ask for a motion and a second for discussion. Motion by Mr. Stein, second by Mr. Arnold. Any questions yeah, for him? Yes, I'd like to, uh, if they build this building, there's, is there or is there not going to be any outside storage allowed? We don't really address that one way or the other, but this is set up for all inside storage as it's set. It's in the C3 commercial district, which does not allow for outside storage unless it's something that they, a product they sell, like right. in a, a Runnings or a Menards or something yeah, like so that. So they could so have firewood along the front there. Or they could could, have, if, if it's for sale. storage unit on Highway 20, and I was under the understanding there was going to be no outside storage, and there's an awful lot of cameras and, and stuff parked outside. I'm on the same, I was under the same assumption. The difference between these two is this is C3 commercial that's storage. That's contractor storage. In contractor storage, you're allowed to put things outside. But I, too, was under the assumption that that project was not going to have any outside storage, yet there's 20 units outside all the time, which is an eyesore. But this is because this is C3 commercial storage. They're not allowed in, in any of the commercial storage facilities that are in the C3 zone up and down the highways. They're not allowed to have any outside storage unless it's something that's for sale. For instance, a runnings that puts panels outside that are actually products for sale. Any other questions? Uh, seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. No old business, Ken? No, no, we withdrew that for now just to further prepare for it. Thanks. Uh, could I get a motion to adjourn? Motion by Mr. Stein, second by Mr. Dolly. All in favor say aye. aye, aye. Opposed? Motion carries. You can let me know when you're ready, Shane. Ready when you are. I'd like, I'd like to call to order the Thursday, March 24th, 2016, Watertown City Plan Commission. Roll call, please. Arnold? Here. Dolly? Here. Hanson? Here. McGuire? Here. Shriver? Here. Stein? Here. Stonebarger? Here. We have a quorum. First item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Uh, under uh, number 2D, we're striking that, correct, Shane? That's the the uh, resolution for the plat on Southside Edition. We're just going to talk with rezone and vacation. I'm requesting action on the rezone and vacation discussion on the plat. Just discuss. Okay, so we won't strike it then. Correct. All right. Could I get a mo or, uh, motion and second? Motion by Mr. Stonebarger. Second. second by Mr. Stein. All in favor say aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Second item on the agenda is the South Side Edition. Okay. All right, we've received a petition. Um, South Side Edition is formerly Block 7 and 8 of the South Side Edition, which is now to be vacated and to be rezoned, uh, is what the petition is for rezoning is from. I-1 Light Industrial to C-3 Highway Commercial District. Um, one of the proposed uses that would go in there is the uh, proposed movie theater. So that's why it needs to be rezoned to a commercial use. It, um, Upon appearance, it would have appear to be a spot zone, but is that's not true in, in essence of what other businesses are in the area. There's a 
hotel across the street that was a conditional use in an I-1. There's other businesses in the area that were conditional uses in I-1. So essentially it's a commercial district. So the reason to C3 from I-1 seems reasonable from, from our standpoint. Um, with regard to that, I, I guess I can leave it at that. If there's any questions on the rezone, I can answer those now. Thank you, Shane. With that, I'll open the public hearing if anyone's here to speak on behalf or against Resolution 201605, the rezone. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing, ask for a motion and a second for discussion. Motion by Mr. Stein. Second by Mr. Arnold. All in favor say aye. Or any, excuse me, any discussion? Any, any other questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is resolution 201606. It's the vacation of the alley. Correct. Same uh, owner petition for um, the vacation of 4th Street. Uh, you can see on the diagram up here, um, there's a right of way established for 12th Avenue South. Uh, east uh, and uh, north, 4th four Street Northeast, or Street Southeast, excuse me, comes from 212 down south into this property and then dead ends into the um, adjoining property to the south. The petitioners have requested vacation of that segment of 4th Street. Um, there is some utilities located in there uh, that are owned. Uh, the one I know is owned by Watertown uh, Municipal Utilities and would need to be uh, relocated and uh, an easement would need to be drafted f for that relocation. But uh, at this point, the petition is to vacate that portion of 4th Street and with the satisfactory relocation of those utilities, um, we have no reason to not support the vacation. They replat the lot into one large lot or not? It, the potential plat will be two lots. Okay. The front lot, is that a, a compliant? Uh, well, the front lot, would the front lot be compliant? Yes. With square footage? Get down to that. So there's the, vac the vacation document is that. Um, the plat, it's a little bit hard to see here. See, the plat would reconfigure across that vacated right away as one lot, as lot two and lot one would be north of there all the way up to 11th Avenue. So, Shane, can you go back to the other? I'm not sure if you have it here. Can you zoom out so we can see all the up to 212? Um, I don't have this is a PDF document I have here. I can bring up the GIS. Okay, so the area in question is if you're following the mouse around along Highway Two or Eighty One along the property known as uh, the John Deere dealership back up. This is all owned by Forsberg and they're coming forward. So the, the two things are to rezone this district and also to vacate this portion of 4th Street Southeast. Okay. The question I have, if this is going to be a commercial lot, the only way out of that commercial lot is going to be up there on, what's that road that goes on to 81, just north of there? 11th Avenue. 11th Avenue, or you go all the way up 4th, and that, those, that's the only points of that's, egress out of there. That's not correct at this point in time. We have, the petitioners will be coming forward with a request for um, driveway entrances so off they'll, of. They'll have a curb cut, but as far as roads. Highway and 81. Yeah. The, and our preliminary discussions with the DOT is that they would allow two entrances in here. The idea that we're being discussed right now is a 
combined driveway here that would serve both lot one and lot two. And then the other driveway would be somewhere south. Right now they're requesting a, the reuse of this entrance on the south edge of the property. However, we're asking them to entertain a driveway which would be lined up across from 12th Avenue. And those are ongoing discussions and things that we're considering and, and that's why we're having just discussion on the plat today. Those items don't uh, affect the um, request for the rezone and the request for the vacation, but they do come into play with our discussions of the final provisions that would come forward on the plat. Okay, when they develop these lots and they're gonna have to build at least half road on 12th Avenue South and 2nd Avenue. We're also discussing that, that when that, what would trigger those development pieces the the so they wouldn't necessarily happen the theater could probably go forward with their plans without development of the road but we need to have a clear path with them on when that roadway would be improved and th that's what we're working on so the theater is on seven and eight right um let me go back to the other drawing theater is basically oh my mouse doesn't show up very well here but 12th Avenue across here the lots are split across right here so lot one is north of this piece of 12th Avenue maybe I'll go back down to the other drawing again okay so Lot one is this piece north. Lot two where the theater is planned is this lot two right here. And it would have access out onto Highway 81. So when the theater is built, they're gonna have to build half the street on 12th Avenue South and also on 2nd Street East? We are talking about the trigger mechanism for the construction of 12th Avenue South, correct? So, it not necessarily it's just. We're identifying the timeline for that. They'll use mostly Highway 81. Their their occupants or their customers would use 81 on and off. That's the plan. That's their so, plan. Yeah. Till lot one gets developed, say a restaurant, something right, goes there, right. then then that'll trigger Fourth Street and Twelfth Avenue. Yep. Because you would have some traffic that could move between lot, the two from lot behind. Lot one there. and the parcels across the street over here would be um, certainly a trigger factor for developing all of those roads. Currently, there's nothing on those behind there. It would be once. It's a gravel road at yeah. this time. Yeah. We, we've looked at this. I, were you around then, Dennis, when we looked at vacating this years ago? Yeah, it was a long time ago. I think we, we proposed it, and it got <laughs> shot down at the time. So, Any other questions for Shane? I'll ask for a motion and a second. And this, is on, this is on the vacation, Resolution 2016-06. Motion by Mr. Arnold, second by Mr. Stein. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Next item is the 201607. It's the plat. It's just for discussion. The reason we're not going to vote on it is they haven't determined exactly where the easements, the utility easements are, and where the curb cuts are for the DOT. Right. Uh, I'll give you a, the most up to date information is see, they identified an easement across this vacated portion of uh, Fourth Street, which would have the municipal utilities um, gas main located within it. However, the, the building plan also occupies a portion of that footprint. So they need to have a plan and negotiate with the utility for the relocation or protection of that gas main facility somewhere else across their lot. And so we, we won't proceed with the final plat until we know what that route is and identify a correct easement over that location. One of the other uh, factors is they're going to put, one of the 
plans that we've seen is has the sanitary sewer coming up along the front of the property along the highway right away but we want to continue the discussion of the extension of those utilities back so that we have access to sewer and water utilities on the 4th Street and 12th Avenue pieces going into the future so and what that could mean simply is that we provide an easement across the south portion of lot one or an easement over portions of either lot one and lot two and that's what we're working with their engineer and, and make sure that we identify <clears throat> how the utilities are going to be extended over to the subsequent streets that would be developed out of this. Shane, when the utilities aren't in a public street and they're going across, say, a parking lot and they have to access that utility, at whose expense do they repave the parking lot? If, if they pave a parking lot over utility easements, then the owner is at risk of having to restore their parking lot if the utility easements need work or the utilities within those easements need work that's the, that's that's the downside of not having them buried in a street and the negotiation of vacating this lot moving the utilities through their own parking lot they may it may be their expense to correct someday yep. and some repair the their ideas, own parking lot yeah and some of the ideas that we've started preliminary discussions on is maybe creating a either a roadway uh, access through here or actually plat the roadway through here rather than a driveway and those are so preliminary right now I wouldn't um, they're just ideas that we're talking about back and forth at this point so there's a potential that this will become a, a roadway but right now that's very very <coughs> preliminary okay thank you any other questions in regard to the discussion on the plat Seeing none, I will go on to item number three, Stony Point, third edition. With this one, Shane, we've got we've got four resolutions. Do we want to talk about them all and vote at the end? In the last one, we talked about each one and then voted individually. We open the public hearing, close the public hearing, and then talk about each resolution. I th that's probably a more viable um, track is to have the public hearing receive all of the input <clears throat> on uh, all of the items re revolved around this project and then um, move forward with actions on the individual resolutions. Thank you. Stony Point, we've been around this one, we've been around this block more than most of us care be around the block but so tonight what we'll do is we're, we're going to take a look at what's in front of us I'd like people uh, I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak in the public hearing if they'd say anything I would like to try to keep the discussion as short as possible so we're not uh, all here too late make a note Dennis Arnold will, will participate in the discussion but will be recuse himself from all votes as he's an adjacent landowner the other thing is uh, South Dakota Wildlife Federation uh, put a put an item on each desk. It was their their thoughts on it. So if you could make a note of that for the public record. Yeah, I guess you can go ahead, Shane, and then I'll open the public okay. hearing. Um, I'm going to do a very brief introduction to the uh, pl preliminary plan before you, for the simple reason that it's very similar to the previous preliminary plan that was acted on and a few months ago um, all of the lot layouts uh, lot lines road widths sidewalk um, and for the most part the route of the road through the prairie hills are essentially the same as the previous preliminary plan there may be some very very minor things with regard to the roadway through Prairie Hills, but that's not essential to the to, to a, a large discussion. What did change is they, they did come back, hear our information request for additional stormwater detention and for water quality facilities. So this plan primarily incorporates those aspects of, 
um, our discussion from the previous plan that we reviewed. It does, does still include a channel, uh, a proposed channel from the Lake Compesca uh, that would share an entrance through the Hidden Valleys channel. And uh, at this time, I guess that's as simple as explanation as I want to provide and, and let the public hearing proceed and bring to light any other discussion. Thank you. With that, I'll open the public hearing if anyone's here to speak. Can I ask that. Shane a question before we move off? Sure you can. This plan you just went through, that's, <laughs> that's not the same, though, as what we had a month or two ago or, or even a week ago. Is that correct? Well, there is a, a change to the route. I, I just want you to plan. clarify that. Yes. The, okay. There are, were some minor changes, correct? The big question, Shane, on this was, last time this was before us, we've approved almost everything in this plan, excuse me, in this plan from road widths to uh, depths. The main, the main thing was we, we weighed, the, <coughs> excuse me, the DENR weighed in on the 100-year stormwater, this 100-year stormwater, 100-year event retention. At that point, uh, we had said, staff had felt that the lake itself uh, handled that load and DNR didn't agree with us, came back and said they have to handle their own. And we sent them back and now this plan does retain the 100 year event. The, the staff received the calculations and the drawings from the engineer and my staff did review those storm uh, calculations and found them to be in compliance with the, our ordinance based on their review of what was submitted to them. Thank you. So you looked through them and your, your staff felt that they uh, they met the, the the excuse me met the requirements of our ordinance of the stormwater detention stormwater and detention water quality facilities. okay correct thank you so I know there's there's some discussion on with the channel with the wetland as to uh, can you tell me how many acres are how many acres are disturbed of that wetland and how that mitigation works reportedly there's about a quarter of an acre of wetlands that would be disturbed or displaced uh, due to the construction of the channel entrance into the Hidden Valley uh, pre-existing channel. And right now, the engineer has indicated that they have hired a consultant that is looking at doing the proper mitigation procedures and would incorporate that into this southwest corner of, I can't remember what lot that is. I think it's lot seven or so, something. I can't read it on there. Lot one of of that portion, but so there are existing wetlands in here, and there's a high ridge or a higher spot, I should say, in that southwest corner, and that's where they plan to mitigate the wetlands. So tell me how tell so me how that works. If we approve a plat that has uh, disruption of the wetland, but they have a plan to move it, where's our our safeguard that that gets done that we we would make that a condition of uh, you know satisfactory mitigation uh, those mitigation plans are submitted to the uh, DENR and and others for review and if they approve that plan then then that's usually all what the city would require so if we approve it and that plan falls through the the entire project stops potentially yes yeah, that, that's I think that's an assurance we need to have I you know I've talked to a few people on that wetland and nobody wants wetlands to be disrupted or moved around there's times that they have to be disrupted or moved around and we always hear the horror stories where they mitigate them 10 miles away in this case the mitigation would happen on that lot that the wetland sits on so whatever they remove remove from the north they'll fill in from the south that's the concept, That's anyway. The plan, yeah. 
Shane, I still need clarification though here. <clears throat> what what I'm looking at on the screen is that the first page in our packet? No, this is. Uh, four, I believe. So the water, the water drainage retention and so forth. From what I in my review in the last two days is different than what I'm looking at on this sheet, and that's what I reviewed yesterday. Um, I just think you need to go through that because I think the retention, water quality, and so forth of how that water is getting into the lake's been a concern, and that that's been talked about. I just want to make sure that we right. that that gets explained here. So, so there's been some enhancements to this facility right here. Okay. And then they've kind of redesigned their um, perimeter of the channel that they'll construct to also be act as a, a detention and um, water quality features there too. So they've... Because <coughs> what I understood, yes, I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, finish. <coughs> so they've, they've kind of been creative in, in how they created um, ponds. In other words, right next to the wall, uh, of uh, that is what I understand. They're going to have a depression that that is below the edge of the wall, and mm -hmm. will run off of these properties down into that area, and be detained. And then it has a filtration system that then helps with the water quality aspect of it, and then ultimately does get released. In this case, if the channel was the ultimate lead to be constructed, that would be released through the wall of the channel through those facilities. Um, if some other path is chosen, I suppose that would release into a grassy swale or some other um, attribute between those. Okay, because what I had understood yesterday <clears throat> when I met with some folks and reviewed this in quite at, at quite length and in, in, in depth was that all of the water that came to the south which on a previous plan that I have in front of me, and I realize that was changed uh, after the agendas were sent out, but all of that drainage to the south and all of those easements and water retention facilities that were on the south are no longer there. All of the water runs to the north into a settling pond and then ultimately is, is piped out of there. The concern we had up north with uh, the Williams property, Conda's property, mm -hmm. was that we had water running down through her property. And, and at one time good. there was a berm and so forth built there. But at this point on the new plan, if I understand it right, there will be no water at all, which probably for years has run down to Conda, but at a slower rate because there was grass and trees and everything else there. And now some of that's gone. But all of that water is collected in that settling pond almost at Drop Correct. down, drop this, down a little further. Yep, this whole area right here is would collect the water that primarily will go into there. Yep. Okay, and then from there, it doesn't go into the channel. It it is runs through a, a storm sewer. You have all that on there. I, I don't see all those lines on there. Am I wrong or? Well, they're hard to see on this at this scale. Um, Basically, to make a long story short, there's nothing going to the east and there's nothing going to the south. Correct. And anything that, that goes into the lake is, is being filtered in settling ponds and then into the lake. Correct. Yep. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. See, I don't think that's the one. Shane. On that green line up there, it gets down to the bottom. There's a, some verbiage there, and it says 20-foot uh, wide easement for ingress and egress and sanitary sewer. How does that sanitary sewer run up there, and where does it get out of the property? Well, the, the sewer main is in within this roadway, except for a portion of it does come through this easement and provide sewer up here for the, to the end. You can show it on there. Doesn't show it. Somebody needs to. Sewer right. We hook up to the existing in this area right here, and then we have a line that comes to here about right here where that uh, emergency road access, that, let's call it green there, 
then we have a line that runs up here to this area here and then come over here into the cul-de-sac and it would service all these these lots in this area from that then from uh, from this point it comes down here around the curve and into this cul-de-sac and the service is the rest of the division subdivision there so it gets out of the property up in the northeast or how does it get this this line up this here there's yeah. how does it leave the parcel so oh, there's a line that runs off to the east runs okay. off this way that direction there so it's, it, it, it's already in place okay. as well as the gas and the water it's all up in that area so there's also a water line that runs uh, existing now but that's going to be have to be relocated and then uh, with new water lines coming down the street into this area here and then they have a, a line that comes down here and it runs west there existing as now now some adjustments has to be made to that as well you know not only for location but also for getting under the channel mm -hmm. some adjustments in that area So I have another question in, on uh, Stony Point Drive, where it's going north, and just as it starts to turn west there, on the east side of that, it looks like there's an access, and it looks like you're stubbing in for a proposed road up in the north oh, right here. there. We just made a provision for future road, should it ever be built, it's there. I mean, we, My we, concern I, is it's coming right off a commercial lot, and if there's a stub for a road there, people might take a shortcut and try to go. What is your intention to put the road will roll the road will roll through there? Will there I think what he's getting at is he, he doesn't want people to think, well, I can just make a go straight and go right through the trailer yeah. the trailer park there. We probably would not build this little short little segment right there. We would just promote this driveway to the south is what we would do and just obliterate that and you know it'd it have to be blocked off is what it had to be done on a drainage plan rod yeah um, all the water is going to run where okay I'll start on the south thing I mean I mean you ex and uh, I know I asked you this question yesterday, sure. and I understand it. So I'm asking a question I know the answer to. Right. But I'm I'm not if if I didn't have if I wouldn't have had a discussion with you yesterday, and I was sitting on the board, I don't think I'd understand it. Sure. Now maybe the rest of you do, and I'm a little dense here today. But no, I'd like to hear it. Oh, that's why I'm asking the question. Okay. Or if you're in your audience, I don't, I sure. wouldn't understand. Well, the drainage, the drainage will be from this area down to into. This, there's a pond right here, and there's a little bit of storm sewer that comes across here into an, another pond on this side to handle the water quality. And both ponds have been designed to handle the 100-year flood in that area. Now the section of the roadway, it, it <coughs> runs to the north to a point about in here where there's a pond alongside the roadway, and we have a, an inlet there as well to pick up that drainage and take it to this pond here as well and then it outlets into this area of the wetland. Now, the drainage in this area here basically runs to the backside of this wall and we're treating and also containing the 100-year flows and releasing that before, as according to our ordinance here, as pre-developed flows. As well as this area here is handling drainage from the north to this pond here and it takes in all this area as well as into this second Stony Point second edition. We're also treating the, the water as well as handling the 100 year flows. Then the water on this side here basically comes down to this point here and we're treating that water and containing the 100 year flows at that point too. So that's the concept of the plan right now. So and the outlet for this pond here is in a storm sewer that comes in and outlets into this corner of the channel to get that water out. So, and then that's, you know, like, you know, we're conforming to the ordinance where we just release it at pre-developed flows. So, and we're also 
removing that drainage off of the property to the east that would flow to the east into that low area and then eventually through the campground. So we're, we're removing that from that. Anything else? It's like they ask. It's like they ask Trump all the time. I want to see if you say the same thing two days in a row here. <laughs> when you said you wanted to mitigate the uh, wetlands area, there's about six acres up there where that channel goes into the Hidden Valley Channel, and it's a mate one of the last fish rearing areas on the lake. And just because you dig out south of there doesn't necessarily mean that's where the fish will go to spawn. The fish may just cease to spawn. I, I have, I still have a concern with that channel going through that fish rearing area. The only area that channel that's going through is right here, and out and in the Hidden Valley a little bit, and that's the area that will need to be mitigated. And that's the only portion that this channel is into the wetland there, and that has been delineated, and we have a consultant looking at that and discussing with the Corps of Engineers who decides what, what is needed to be done as far as mitigation and well, what the I, I understand you can dig a hole and then plant some weeds there and call it mitigation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's where the fish will naturally go to spawn now. That's the problem. This part of the wetland right here there's a berm right there, and it separates it from the lake is what it does. You have two types of wetlands there. One is called a riverine-type wetland, which is the lake, and the other part is very similar to what's down in this area here. So and that's the classific classification that has been determined by the Corps. So now it's, that's about the extent that I know of it. The, the consultant that we're working with, she knows a whole lot more than I do about it. Shane, can you pull up an aerial view so we could actually see an aerial view from what it actually looks like? I'd like to see that where that berm is uh, from the aerial view to kind of get our bearings. It might be difficult to see because you got a lot of brush and like willow trees and things like that. So it looks like that about where the. Can you zoom in any closer or not? No, I can. Yeah. I believe right in here is the area that um, where that would exit into the channel. It's real close to that. That berm. The, the berm he's talking about is this little ridge right here that holds water back here. And when it gets deep enough, it ultimately overtops that through this little. And Rod, portion. what's the area that you anticipate that you'll be removing? Well, there's two areas that we're dealing with. We're talking, a, you know, 25 hundredths of an acre is this area back in here. And the other. 15 hundredths of an acre is this area right into the channel. So that's a riverine type wetland. When the, <coughs> when the channel exits and goes into the Hidden Valley Channel, is there any protection on that piece where we'd probably see right now where that little bit of dark where the water goes there? Is there any protection there? What, what exactly does the channel look like? I, I see this kind of a finger that goes out on there. Is that cement? Is that That's, that finger that you're referring to is, is right along this edge right here. And what that is there is a, the berm that was developed years ago when, as I understand it, when they dug the channel for the, the old Stalime, I hope I pronounced that right, in that channel. So the boats that they ferried around back by the Williams back in the years ago, and that's what they when they dug that channel, that's where they piled the dirt from that. And so that finger is it? Is it's dirt? There? That's a pot, that's a mound of dirt in there. Okay, it's, and and then on the nose of it would be, that would be the wetland. That would be the that, reeds and things there. 
Yeah, that is correct. I assume that's that's the biggest concern is when boats come in and out of there, they would disrupt that area there. That's why yeah. I asked. And on that finger, the, the top of that finger basically is not classified as part of the wetland. You just have to get off to the side a little bit. Any other questions for Rod while I have them up there? Anyone else have anything in regard to the public hearing? I'm going to close it if nobody has anything to say. I figured that'd stir something. I'm uh, Dave Johnson with the Compesca chapter of the Isaac Walton League. And uh, I'm just here because uh, Bob Bemis contacted us. Bob Bemis can't be here today. He's the president of the uh, Hidden Valley Services Homeowners Association. And he sent the message that he asked us to share that the association is opposed to any boat canal that would use our existing canal and or its entrance. The association also feels that the existing wetlands be left as is and not disturbed. A canal would disrupt these essential wetlands and also cause pollution to Lake Compesca and the Hidden Valley Channel. Please forward this onto the Plan Commission so that our association can go on record in opposition to disturbing the wetland area. And uh, the Isaac Walton League also continues to maintain that the wetlands should not be disturbed. So that's it. I have one question on the R Canal. Whose canal is that? On the Hidden Valley Canal? It's, it's public, correct? The canal is maintained by the Hidden Valley. How do they uh, maintain how? Under maintain, an association? I understand. I'm not a member, so I can't really, sp I'm not well informed, but I understand that pay, they pay for the dredging frequently whenever it's needed for the opening of that, to maintain that canal opening. Yeah, I, I would like, because I, <coughs> I've always questioned that. I've seen some old maps where that was actually lotted, but once you open it up and you allow public water in there, is it public water or is it private? And if it's yeah. private, how do you, how, how does another person access a I, private canal? I happen to live in, in uh, Hidden Valley. Our, our property extends to the center of the channel that's the property line, but once you flood water, of course, that's navigable and other people can use it, so they do. But the Hidden Valley Association assesses all of the owners that live in Hidden Valley, a homeowner's assessment every year that we pay, and that money is set aside for the maintenance of two things. It used to be for the maintenance of the road because the road was a private road and also the channel. And we also own some land, the boat ramp at the end of the channel, that particular piece of property is owned by Hidden Valley, so we maintained the boat ramp too with that money. Since that time in the early years, the road was deeded over to the city, so we no longer have to maintain the road. The city took over the road, but we still maintain the channel and the boat ramp and the property that goes with the boat ramp. And you probably maintain it at your own expense. At our expense, at the Hidden just, Valley out, out, out of just the goodness of your heart because you use it, but it's actually public. It's public property, yes. but if yeah. it would just fill in, you'd be at the ground underneath it is not public property, right? So the so the homeowner, you can you can sit up there, John. We need to have you for the. Did record. I did I say that right, John? No. Yeah, I didn't. The, the, oh the, come on! No. It would be. <laughs> You're an attorney. I don't care what I said. I wouldn't say the right. So the thing. ground the ground underneath it, John, is it was he right on to the middle of the channel or was he all the way over on the channel? All the way over. It was man-made channel. It was platted uh, by Shul and Bartron when they platted uh, Hidden Valley. And that land, and, the, and the channel was built in, but uh, was never deeded to the city, never deeded to anybody. Not the land underneath it, no. It's, it's kind of like being a farmer right now. If your land's flooded and you can get on it, you're okay. But if the lake level, level goes down, and you can't come through. As long as I'm floating, I'm okay. Yeah, that's about right. If I'm standing in there, I'm trespassing. I'm trespassing. So, so actually, the 
the, there's a lot. Probably the channel is probably a, a platted lot of some sort. I think I think the lots, and I'm, I'm speculating here a little bit, but I think the lots go to the center of the channel, like Dennis talked about. And the and as far as the the Hidden Valley Association, they're they're dredging that and maintaining that at their own expense, at their own prerogative. Otherwise, they would be waiting for the state to. If it blew in and you couldn't get in there, you'd, if you didn't do it, nobody would do it. And then hell would freeze over before that happened. Exactly. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Paul Hinderacker, representing the Lake Kapeska Water Project District Board of Directors. Um, Uh, I don't care. Platt would be fine. Um, we have submitted, or at least I tried to submit, our respec engineering report. Um, several people, including just a few minutes ago John Wiles, emailed me that I did not manage to get the report attached to the email. So I guess my question is, did you get the report? No. Did anybody get a report? I sent it to S city engineering Shane. staff. Got it late this afternoon. Oh, we got it late this afternoon because we didn't get the other one until two days ago. Um, but we have this report, and uh, if if people don't have copies of it before them, we will get copies before the day is out so that you can review them. And um, it's all technical stuff, but I'm just going to read the conclusion if you don't have it in front of you. The Stony Point 3rd Edition 2016 preliminary plans still result in a significant increase of the site's area draining to Lake Kempeska as discussed in our previous review. These revised plans do include water quality BMPs and make effort to provide on-site storage for the two and a hundred year storm events as required by the city's post-construction stormwater best management practices manual. However, we have identi identified potential issues with the placement and errors in the sizing of the proposed BMPs. Point number one, the pre-development peak flow rates in the plans are calculated using higher runoff coefficients than allowed in the manual. This results in an underestimation of the required BMP storage volumes. Second bullet point, the post-development runoff hydrographs used for MBP routing are incorrect and underestimated. This results in an underestimation of required BMP storage volumes. Third bullet, outflow hydrographs from two BMPs appear to have abnormal jumps that could be explained further that should be explained further fourth bullet six of the seven BMPs are located below the 10-year water surface elevation of Lake Campesca and all seven BMPs are located below the 100 year water surface elevation this could affect the ability of each BMP to provide consistent protection of Lake Campesca's water resources also, the plans state that all stormwater conveyance and treatment facilities are intended to be turned over to the city upon acceptance of the final construction. Understized BMPs may result in more frequent overtopping, potentially creating increased maintenance issues and an increased chance of BMP failure. In order to correct the identified issues, significant changes to the design and drainage easements proposed in the Stony Point 3rd edition 2016 preliminary plans will likely be required. Thank you for the continued opportunity to provide services and so on. Thank you, Paul. So I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get my arms around this one. First, I'll ask our engineering department, the city engineering department, you went through, you stated earlier, you went through the numbers that were provided to you by Austin Engineering, and it it met our ordinance requirements and held the hundred year flood event. That's what my staff's review of the calculations indicated to me. Yes. And 
Lake and Pesca Watershed says their engineering, engineering firm looked at it and they find some potential discrepancies in there that may make, uh, may bring to light that it does not. So we're at a, we're at a standstill. And I'll, I'll make one statement here. I did check. I called the city, uh, the county assessor's office, and I said, how many, how many properties abut Lake Compesca? The, the number is 755. Not one of them holds the 100-year flood event. And I said, well, how can we make somebody hold the 100-year flood event when we have 755 times? We've allowed lots not to do it. But the answer is two wrongs don't make a right. What we have is we have a resource that we try to maintain and make better all the time. Our ordinance says when a develop like this comes into town, they have to be able to, to handle the 100-year flood event. And so now we're at, a, we're at a standstill where we say our engineering department has, has brought us plans before us that says it does. Another engineering department says it doesn't. So what do you do? You know, my, my first thought was table the motion and see if we couldn't get the city, the developer, Lake and Pesca Watershed to agree on an arbitrator and go in and find out what the right answer is. I don't think we could get all four of them to agree on the expense of it and to whole scale say, I'll, I'll take whatever the arbitrator says. So that's probably not the best idea. In the plan commission, what we do is we make a recommendation to the city council. All we can do is look at the information that's been given to us, make a decision, make a recommendation to the city council. The city council has to act on our recommendation. If it sits for 90 days and is not acted on, it becomes, it becomes a law ordinance, whatever you would say. So I think what we have to do is I, I want to make sure that I think the resource is too great to not do our due diligence and just let something go through and not get that that engineering study. I think, I think it bodes that we need to look at it. And when I say we, I mean the city. Uh, today, what's in front of us, I think we have to act on what we have with the information we have. I think whatever we do, if we pass it, we have to make it with a recommendation to the city council that they take, that, that our engineering department takes a look at what has been given to us today. And I know you guys didn't get the information many, many weeks ago, and we didn't get the information many, week, many weeks ago. We don't even have it right now, you know. So, and I don't want to discount what they've done. I think it has to be looked at, but I think it can be looked at between here and the city council. My thoughts, anyway. You know, I don't think it's fair to Lake Pesca Watershed to pass something and say we didn't take into consideration what you had. The problem is it's hard to take consideration, take it into consideration at this point. But we do have a stop loss in there that this still goes before the city council on a first and second reading, and they, you know, I think our our recommendation has to be to them that what we see before us meets it. But there's some questions that have come up and they need to be addressed before the city council uh, gives it their grace either in either direction I have a question for you Shane <clears throat> how much of a wetland can you disturb that you do not have to medic mitigate you know I don't have that answer right off the top of my head but it is there is a small amount of wetlands that you're able to displace annually without going through any permitting process obviously this is a highly sensitive area and I think that the developer and his engineer are attempting to satisfy any mitigation requirements despite the size of the wetlands that they're, they're disturbing so I don't know that that's really a point of contention. Shane do you feel like you've and your staff has had enough time to do due diligence to study the data that uh, Mr. Hinderacker's firm provided? No, absolutely not. We uh, received that uh, mid-afternoon this afternoon um, and have not had a chance to thoroughly review what their comments are. Um, at this point, I was, we've relied on the information that was provided by the engineer <coughs> and his design calculations and our staff as with all projects goes through that information and make sure that that the math was done correctly and the right reviews were done and my staff had indicated to me that their opinion 
that that was all that all the requirements were met, and uh, so I would need to re compare the two reviews, but um, you know the engineer would have to substantiate or stand behind his calculations in lieu of the staff review. I mean, ultimately he's signed the plans and and has to stand behind his calculations as well. So you have had adequate time to review the engineer's design and so forth from the developer's engineer. You had time, adequate time to go through those, but you have not had adequate time to review the oppositions. Correct. Okay. What's your, <coughs> excuse me, what's your recommendation from staff? We, we look at, I mean, I, I think the information that's coming from Lake Pesca Watershed could be significant, and it's a resource that's important enough that we don't want to make the wrong decision. Uh, are you comfortable with us acting on these, possibly moving them on to the city council and then stepping back and stopping the city council from going forward if you find more information? <laughs> yes, I'm good. Yep. Before you comment, Shane, um, one thing I did want to mention is in the resolution, it does say that the water quality facilities and the water quantity facilities shall be designed and constructed in accordance with the city's BMP manual. So if we have two engineers that are disputing about whether or not it is in compliance, your recommendation to the city council is that it be in compliance. They can go forward with the project if it is in compliance. It's just a matter of, like I said, the two math wizards of these two reports stating whether or not it is in compliance with the city. So the plans would have to be in compliance. The resolution says that the plans would have to be in compliance. You just have two engineers that are disputing on the numbers. So once it gets to the city, that will be the city's question. Does this plan meet it? And they'll have to make a decision. And this will give the city a chance to say what has or hasn't happened <coughs> with this new report that has come from the watershed project. And I, I've asked many times as to how come Game Fish and Parks hasn't weighed in on this, how come Corps of Engineers hasn't weighed in on this, and the answer I get every time is they're not going to spend their time and money until we approve something at the city, you know, until something goes forward at the city level, then they'll weigh in. They're not going to they're not going to spend time looking at it and giving us their impression until we've decided what we want to do. So it's kind of the chicken or the egg, which comes first. I, I think part of it is we have to continue to move the plans along so the other entities can weigh in on their thoughts on these plans. It seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that um, the commission needs to have read what's before it um, before they ought to make a recommendation to the city the commission did read what was before it, but your plan was not before it in a timely manner. Well, wait a minute. I, I'm sorry. We have had not had a chance. I this was a published meeting, and we are supposed to get all our documents so that we can read them, and we are only supposed to make decisions on the documents that we have. When you bring something in at the last minute, we don't have a chance to review that, so if we're going to make a decision, we have to make a decision on what we have had. Well, I think the last time we had that, we had a book handed to us in front of us right before our meeting. And I don't think it's fair to the members of the planning and zoning up here. And I just, it's not And good. I don't it's think good. it's fair to our engineer to produce this stuff a day or two ahead of time. I, I'm not trying to be arbitrary. This is what we have to follow in our rules. We're and dependent on the city to get this stuff. Th these are rules set down by the state, and if Luke was here, he could fill you in on that. But we are bound by those, and we cannot take something at the last minute that the public hasn't seen. I think I think we're I think you're both right. You're, you're both right at the fact that hey, we get something shows up. We have deadlines at the city, as your documents have to be to the city if they want to get on our agenda they come in on this date but there's a lot of other moving parts in there from the time they come to the city our engineers look at it anyone else who wants to look at it we run out of we run out of time before the f the 415 meeting every other Thursday and that's why I think it's important that we realize that what we do 
is a recommendation to the city council. There's still a there's still two other big steps in the first and second reading at the city council. We're we're just the catalyst for those meetings. We look through it. We look at the information, like John said, that we have, and and make our decision. That the city council at that time may be given more information than what we had, and and in this case, I think that's what they're going to have. And and Shane, just out of curiosity, how long does it, you know, what's the process for your your department to stop what they're doing, take a look at this this new data, and uh, give me the timeline of the first and second reading at its earliest, okay. if you put it on the council's agenda. If, you know, the council will take whatever recommendation comes from the board, say, for instance, if tonight you gave a recommendation, it would, be go, it would go to the next two consecutive um, or uh, council meetings, so essentially both meetings in April. If final approval of the plat uh, was given at that second meeting, there is a 20-day waiting period from publication of that notice, which is usually the following Saturday. So essentially 25 days from the second reading is when the final plat and approvals would all be um, become permanent 20 so, days after the council so yes, meeting the so second council so meeting. so you're looking at sometime well into may before everything is final final before they could pr proceed do you have and to do you have to put it on the next meeting in two weeks or can it if your if your department says it's going to take us a little bit longer to flush through all of this can you wait a month and put it on put it on at the four and six week or the six and eight week is it your prerogative for that i would have to review the the letter of the uh, ordinance stuff. There is a time period in there, but um, primarily that time period is if we fail to act on anything, which I guess I, I would have to ask legal counsel if the action taken by the planning commission tonight satisfies that some action has been taken. But say, for instance, we got this plan, and we did get this plan on March 11th. If we waited and that and didn't take any action at all, when we hit the, the threshold of that time limit, everything that they proposed to us would be automatically approved. Uh, and I guess I'd have to ask council if that, if planning commission means that we did act on it or not. Well, and what I'm getting at, and I, and I apologize if I wasn't clear, lawyers aren't always clear, um, okay. is that the resolution as it reads, <coughs> at the end of the day does require that this plan comply with the city's BMP manual. So, I mean, in other words, the, this commission would have set something in motion that says that it must meet the manual. So if that is the only issue with this plan in this public hearing, that's all I've heard other than the wetlands, then the plan can move forward because these developers, under the lot agreement as well, would have to comply with the manual. And the question is, there's two opinions as to whether or not they apply, and how do you settle that without, without long litigation? That's why my first, my first concept was, can we get all three in the same room with a neutral person to, decide, to determine what's right and what's wrong? But there seems to be a different opinion as to, are we meeting it or not? Are we not, like John said, what we have before us, that was given to us by the city staff was that it does meet uh, the requirements that we asked for. I want to say something else, Pat. <clears throat> from the very beginning of this plan, I have abstained from any votes in regard to it because uh, as a perceived conflict of interest, <coughs> and I'm not going to vote today, whether I have a conflict of interest or a perceived conflict of interest, my attorney, John Wiles, advised me not to vote, and City Attorney Stanton advised me not to vote. So I've, I've done that. But I also have a responsibility sitting on this board and this committee to look objectively and ask the right questions to get, to get the answers brought out. If I, if I can't do that, I might as well resign this board. So that's why I'm speaking today. I've been pretty quiet. And I'm not trying to influence any of you. But as I, as I look at this whole emotional issue from, the, from, I don't know how many months, years it goes back, but there's been four concerns that have come before us. One's been drainage, one's been water retention, 
one's been water quality, and one's been disturbing wetlands. Those are the four issues that we've all been concerned about. Whether we want houses up there or not, whether we want a development, or whether we'd rather see it like Con would like to see it, you know, we all have opinions on that, but we don't own the land. So I've had to digest all of this and look at those four things because those have been the things. And all of those four relate to the adjacent landowners, which I am one, and I've been concerned about how it affects me and how it affects Lake Compesca. And legitimately so, we need to look at that. But I believe that the developers have in my opinion, because I'm affected by it, I believe they've satisfied the drainage concerns that we've all had. Con, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the drainage, but, but I did. I, I spent a lot of time and I reviewed it and I met with the engineers and went through it. Water retention, I spent a lot of time and I reviewed the water retention. I'm satisfied as, a, as an adjacent landowner with those two things. Water quality, I don't know. I know we've got engineers saying two different things and I think our city attorney has, has told us and our best practice manuals and everything says what it has to meet. So if it's approved and it does not meet that, it doesn't meet it. If it meets it, it meets it. We satisfy that, if, we, if it can be satisfied. The wetlands, that's beyond our control. We don't make that decision. DNR and Game Fish and Parks and those other governmental agencies determine that. So I don't, I don't know, you know, we can't deal with that up here. So I think we just have to look at what we can deal with and let the other agencies answer those other questions, I guess. I think you're correct on that. And, and I've asked some of those other agencies, why haven't you weighed in? Why can't you make our decision easier? And they said, we, we, don't, we don't do that until you make your decision. And it's an emotional issue in Watertown because any of us who grew up in Watertown or surrounding Watertown, we all have lots of memories of Stony Point. I mean, we could all tell stories of living out in Stony Point and what happened out there and all the fun times we had. So it's an emotional issue, and it has a lot of historical background that affects all of us. But we have to put all of that aside and look at the facts, whether we like them or not, and what's before us. I don't know. If, if I had an opinion, a personal opinion, yeah, I'd probably state that. But as a board member, I, that doesn't make any difference what my personal opinion is. All right, thank you. Does anyone else like to speak in the public hearing before I close it? Mr. Chairman, just, excuse me. Procedurally, yes, the commission, like you said, has reviewed all of the facts. It's not up to them to second guess what the city had determined under their calculations. That second guessing would, <coughs> is basically an argument that will be made later before the city council, and by then they will have reviewed the information. But your, my understanding is that the commission's job is to basically ask to make sure that they did what they were supposed to do. The city has come forward and said, this complies. And like you said, everything has gone into place. And your recommendation does say that it must comply. So once it gets to the city council, that issue will probably be raised again, but by then the city will be able to confirm what they have told you today. Thank you. Anyone else in the public hearing before I close it? I would just reiterate, I think you ought to take a look at what we got before you decide. Yeah, thank you. With that, I'll close the public hearing. I did look through the resolutions to make sure they had the items in there that we talked about before when we had planned it, and that's the road widths, the uh, permitting, things like that. The one thing that I was, I wanted to make sure was in there that no permits will be issued until the road's constructed through the Prairie Hills development. My fear was is we've got a small 20-foot gravel easement, and if uh, too much development starts up there, it's going to turn into a highway and damage someone else's property, and I didn't, I didn't think that was fair. Uh, so first what we'll do is we'll act on uh, 3B. It's, it's Commission Action Resolution 2018. What that is, it's a preliminary plan option with the channel as, as to how we see that in front of us. What I need is a motion and a second for discussion. Motion by Mr. McGuire. Do I have a second? Second, second by Mr. Hansen. Discussion on this is the commission act. This is uh, the preliminary pre preliminary plan option one with the channel resolution 2016-08. Myself, I just want to kind of reiterate what we've asked the developer to do, and he's 
uh, from our staff standpoint, he's, he's satisfied everything that we've asked him to do to this point. There's a few other things, including uh, like a pest or watersheds uh, engineering study that I think will still come into play before the council hears this. I still other? have concerns about the wetlands. And even though I mitigated, I still don't think we're going to have the same fish rearing that we have now. So I do too on the wetlands. I you, can't support it. You, you look, and when it comes, when it does come to the wetlands, it, you know, no disruption is better than some. But in some points, there'll there'll be some disruption. You, uh, there's a plan out there that they have to remitigate it. Their their plan is to reget it, mitigate it at the other end of the wetland, and you hope that the disruption is minimal. Any other discussion, Blake? I got a question on 14. So that's, we, we talked about this before, where they need to enter into agreement with the Hidden Valley Homeowners Association. That was what we had done there is in earlier dates, we talked that if they're going to use this channel, that channel of water, they have to enter into an agreement with that homeowners association because those people are uh, paying dues and fees to maintain that plan. So my, maintain my, the, the, my the question on that is if they cannot come to an agreement with the homeowners association, what happens to the resolution? At I, that point? I think it dies at that point. It's there's there's fourteen items on that resolution and they have to they have to meet every, all fourteen. Absolutely. Pat, I got a question. With uh, with the building and stuff out there that's gonna happen and I'm newer, I'm a newer person on this board too, but what's the, you know, so you got, you know, you got rubbish out there and, you know, s stuff laying around. What's, what's the protocol so the neighbors aren't looking at things laying around out there? I mean, I'm not saying the same thing, you know, leave the same thing laying there. How long do you, Dennis, maybe you can answer that. I'd question. look at it this way, Dennis. This way is ask Dr. Ken Johnson up in the north part of town. We've dealt with that up there. Where, I know. I've, I've where, it, where and, and that's part of this project where you look and go, it's just, it's in a perpetual state of destruction. And if we can just get it moving forward and get some grass and some trees. And I, the answer for you is how do you keep things from blowing around? There's ordinances in place in regard to littering, things like that, and it has to be done by complaint, you know, to the police department, and you hope you hope that all the neighbors are orderly. Dennis, from a contracting standpoint, the, the contractor that's working on that property or the property that owner that owns it, it's their it's their job to maintain that property in an orderly. Right. As, as a contractor, it's my responsibility to keep my job site clean, and if there's garbage and refuse that blows onto neighbors, it's my responsibility to get it picked up. As a developer, it's their responsibility, and it was my responsibility, too. And that road's going in, and various people or contractors are working, and various things laid around. As a developer, it's my responsibility to keep it clean. Now, the, the subcontractor working underneath me <clears throat> might be a little sloppy and leave things laying around. Um, either I have, as a developer, I have to be on his back and say, get it cleaned up, get it picked up, or I myself go pick it up. If the road gets dirty, I have to go sweep the road. You know, as a developer and as a contractor, it falls on those two people. And then when you're, when you're building stuff, you know, with some runoff going into the adjacent owner's property, I mean, where does, where's the liability at there? Whoever pull, pulls the building permit. Ken, you can answer, but whoever pulls a building permit on a house has that responsibility. Well, it's if, they, if they sign off on it, otherwise, ultimately, it's a homeowner. If, if nobody else takes responsibility, it falls back to the owner of the property. So and, and that's the individual the, lot sold, and they are responsible. That's the hard part. When we see these plans, especially up in the northeast part of town, you see these beautiful plans, and that's when they're finished. But it could be five, six years before they're finished. In the meantime, you're right. Water runs the wrong way. A 40-mile-an-hour wind blows, and... They were in the middle of shingle in the place, and it, that, that's the hard part where everybody has to try to get along, but it, uh, it's why we like to move things along and get them done. Otherwise, uh, a five-inch rain causes a lot of problems that, that uh, the plan didn't show. Well, and as a developer, if you've got the first, second, third house, if those go in and those are a mess and you've got stuff all over and you've got trees laying down, you name it, around there, you're not going to want that or you're not going to sell any lots. Nobody wants to move into a neighborhood that looks like that and live like that for five or ten years. So, you know, you have to do your diligence and keep it clean. 
Any Thank you, Chairman. I, I want to make one comment because the, the point on 14 has been brought forward, and I, I just want to iterate that we want good faith effort in the agreement with the channel um, with Hidden Valley. It's not staff's intention to hamstring this process by demanding that that agreement be made because then it gives somebody complete control over uh, this project from a different angle. And I just want that to be clear that we want a good faith effort is the reason that bullet point is in there. And it's not, I mean, to make it a, a, a written law, I, I don't know how you could force somebody that to go to a negotiating table and have an unwilling negotiator sitting across from them. That's not our intent with that. We just want to make sure that this developer understands how he's impacting his neighbors and making a, a, at least a very good faith effort to negotiate that. I, it's not my intention to put handcuffs on that. Thank you. Any other discussion? In due respect for Mr. Hinderocker and you know the people on the lake boards out there, what I want to reiterate what Pat says is you're going to have a, enough time between the next meeting for the, for them to study what you got in front of you right now. Well, I, I think it's extremely important that our recommendation is is that it's taken very seriously, and he did the side of caution on that because once we make it, once we allow for something to happen, you 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 can't unring the bell. Well, <clears throat> with that in mind. As long as this project is taken and drawn out, what is the downside of allowing the uh, city's engineer to to do due diligence and study the uh, opposing engineer's uh, findings, and then come back the next planning commission with a strong conviction? Yes, we've looked at the other opposing viewpoint, and we feel you know very confident in our position. Or perhaps there'll be some things that haven't been looked at. I'm not saying there is or isn't, but. Again, I'm just wondering, you know, what what's the, what's the downside of that? I mean, this this thing. Yours, what, yours, your, the question would be, could we table it and bring it back? We're in our third year of this. And that's right. So what's one? So what's one more meeting going to hurt? Or one more after that? Or I, one I more think after one that? Said that uh, you know, we <coughs> they have to agree to the city's BMP manual, and the two engineers can argue it out, and they will probably argue for a long time, and <coughs> we wait for two weeks. Are they still going to be arguing, or you know, are, is this an unnecessary delay of the project or not? I'm just saying that 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 I feel I could vote with stronger conviction if I knew that the city engineer had an opportunity to look at all the data, uh, rather than you know kind of a shall we say a kind of sort of recommendation and let the city you know let city council figure it out. Isn't that kind of what our responsibility is from the get-go? Yeah, but with the bullet points in there, it says they have to agree with these 15, 16 bullet points, and we're just saying the project should or shouldn't go to the city council, and at some point in time it has to be resolved with the city to make sure all these bullet points are satisfied. I think it makes it's, it adds a sense of urgency once once we move move something forward it adds a, a significant sense of urgency otherwise it can sit in front of us for another year and next time there's another uh, another thing that comes up and another and another pat there are just a couple of things that if you approve this that go to the city council that i'm concerned about number one the wetlands that thing has not been that nobody has really said that that isn't going to or at least i haven't heard people say that's isn't going to disrupt the fishery, you know. And so if you move that forward, you're saying, well, that's taken care of maybe. Or, and now we're talking about this other issue, and, and they're, the people from the lake are saying that that's not accurate. And, and I mean, it's not a reflection on Shane, I don't think. I think it's just a reflection. There's more information. And when you ask them, now, you can send it to the city council. But we know what we have to face, and that's the same conversation that you're saying here. And I've been on that side where I'm making decisions for that too, and they're not fun. Okay. And, but you do have more information out here, and it's if, you know, and you ask for input, and, but now say, well, I'm just saying, because we'll address it when we come to it, and 
I think those are the concerns that we're going to have and the wetlands, I, I, just, draw, I just can't see that channel, how that's not going to completely disrupt that, but maybe I'm wrong, but fisheries people and so on. Um, as far as that wetland goes, it has to. It, when, they, when they mitigate it, that still has to be approved through. They have, there's permitting that they have to go yeah. through from level, high levels far more than us. And I do want to say, like Lisa said, is our engineering staff has looked at it, and they do feel it meets that. Now, if other information comes up, they'll take that into consideration before it goes to the city council. Mr. Chairman, just for clarification again, um, item number six on the resolution you're considering does address uh, the wetland and it does uh, spell out that the wetland mitigation plan identifying the amount and location of wetlands shall be that shall be created is one of their requirements so um, if there is to be wetlands disturbed there is a path that they need to clarify their mitigation plan so And I do think the wheels start turning once we make our decision. If we choose to move it forward, I think there's a lot of other things that are going to start happening with some I care about agencies higher up. Too. I don't want anything disrupted out there, but like you guys said earlier, for the game, fish, and parks to take a look at it, it's got to start going somewhere. It'd be nice if they did it beforehand. It'd help us out, but that's not the way I guess it works. Not to muddy the waters, yep. but... If, as Shane said, um, he did not want to hamstring the Stony Point and the Hidden Valley on, the, on an agreement, I would suggest changing that, just a little caveat on that section, that Stony Point reasonably or in good faith participate in coming to an agreement with Hidden Valley, because right now it does use the will or shall. Uh, motion was made by Mr. McGuire, second by Mr. Hansen. Are you comfortable with, as Lisa stated, in item number 14, that the negotiation for the operation and maintenance of that channel is in good faith? Meaning if Hidden Valley could say some, anything they want, if they don't agree to it, it's dead. They, they, have, to, they have to negotiate in good faith under the supervision of our city attorney. I'd be willing to amend it as she stated, so. Okay. You agree with that, Jason? Yes. yes. Any other discussion? So what we'll do is I'll ask for a vote on, on resolution 201608. It's the preliminary plan option one with the channel. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Uh, roll call, please. We're going to vote on the four of these things. <coughs> Arnold is abstaining. Dolly? Yes. Let's see. Hanson? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stein? No. <coughs> Stonebarger? No. With the Plan Commission, we have a seven-member panel that requires a uh, simple majority of four votes to pass so them. The resolution passes. Uh, next, next item to be voted on, and I may ask for a little more information, Shane, on this. This is resolution 210609. It's the preliminary plan without the channel. That's correct. What, what I essentially wanted to be able to do is give you an example of uh, what the resolution alternatives would be if the channel was something that was uh, struck down through this proceeding. And um, so whatever action you choose to take, I mean, um, if you want only one resolution to go to the council for approval, um, you could either vote this resolution down or if you wanted the council to consider both 
you could potentially pass this one and then they would have to weigh in on whichever uh, direction you chose. So the question I had earlier is the developer didn't present us a plan without the channel, but they agreed to, to have us look at the project without a channel? No, that is not what their request was. I just thought if they, through this proceeding, say they came and spoke and agreed to something alternate to what they had. I think I, I see where you're, I, I, I think I'd like to, I, it seems unconventional to vote on it, but because we did have a split vote on the first part of it and the, and the council needs to know what that vote was when it goes to them, that it wasn't a unanimous vote from the plan commission. I think I would like to vote on this resolution so they would at least have an idea where our thought process was. You know, was it the channel that was hanging it up? Was the road width? Was it was it the lot size? So they'll have an idea of where the where the uh, uh, the differences were. So, between so one of the caveats on the previous one was you know the, the state coming back and approving the channel. So if we were to vote on this and approve it, and the state comes back and you know doesn't approve the channel, they would still have a path forward. That was my th thought when I first saw it. I thought, you know, it, it's still a nice development, potentially with or without a channel. I, I think from a developer standpoint, he needs to know where our issues were. You know, I mean, there's a, uh, a plot like this is big. I mean, a development is big. There's a lot of things we've gone through. There just happens to be a couple of things that, that we didn't agree on. So I, I think we do vote Mr. on it. Mr. So, Chairman, before uh, you finish and initiate a vote, I want to just be, um, say this as a matter of fact, if the, if the option of the development without a channel is considered, it will change the grading plan somewhat as to the area of land that the channel would impact. And I would ask for direction from the plan commission as to whether they would want a revised grading plan to come back before you for review, or if you would direct staff as, in, as an engineer to review those and, and bring that forward to the council for their ultimate review. So in other words, similar to the review of the stormwater calculations, I would like some type of direction that gives me to take either something back to you or to the council for their ultimate approval, but something that it would require some minor changes to this. Yeah, and I looked at it and thought, well, if it's without a channel, you assume the water would still be held in the general areas, and that would be the assumption we would make, that if if we approve it, uh, not requiring it to come back before us, as long as the, the adjustments to the grading are, are considered minimal and considered uh, what we would look at almost usual and customary as to where you would you would see. I'd, I wouldn't want to make them have to go through, but I do think it's important that the council has an idea, can get their arms around a little further Mr. as Chairman, to what we thought. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion to approve 201609 with a caveat that any changes in the grading plan the engineering department would take directly to the city council. I have a motion by Mr. Stoneberger. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Dolly. Any other discussion on that? I think they know what our guidance is on that. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Resolution 201610, the, the Plata Stony Point 3rd edition. You want to review that real quick? 2016-10. Uh, That's the actual plat. The first two were preliminary plans. This is a, the actual plat. Shane, this is very, this, this is what we've approved in the past. This is lot sizes, road width, uh, sidewalk. Correct. Any modifications whatsoever from what we've gone over in the past? It would, in our development agreement, we'll be discussing access to those ponds for, um, 
for maintenance and inspection rights. Okay. That, that will be, yes, that will be handled through the development agreement. Right. Anything else? I need a motion and a second to approve uh, 2016-10, the Plata Stony Point 3rd edition. So moved. Motion by Mr. Stonebarger, second by Mr. Dolly. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, 3E is the, the resolution 2016-11, the Plata Prairie Hills development, 3rd edition. I believe that's where the road moves down to the south. Any issues with that, Shane? Any any changes or modifications to what we've seen before? No, no, there's no changes. Okay, thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve. Motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Stonebarger. Second, second by Mr. Stein. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Got F, uh, resolution 2016-12, the plat of lot H1, Prairie Hills Development, second edition. It's the back half of that road. Anything on this, Shane, any different than what we've looked at in the last months? No, no comments. Okay. Ask for a motion and a second. Motion by Mr. Stonebarger. He's been busy. You moved your lips. You got, you, <laughs> you made the vote. Second by Mr. McGuire. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Opposed, motion carries. Any old business, Shane? New no. business, executive session. I request a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Stein. Second by Mr. McGuire. All in favor say aye. Opposed, motion carries.